All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed through drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So how how is your experience with this uh, open broadcast system? I'm hoping that in another day or so, I can now connect it to uh, Odyssey and then start working over there. <laughs> Carolyn is saying, I was commenting about your new audit. It's BS that you have to keep fighting. Yes, so now I have uh, lots of uh, audits by lots of <laughs> places that are going on. So YouTube reviews and complaints to YouTube and getting the videos down on YouTube is a smaller thing now. There are bigger complaints. So today there is a new audit started. But anyways, that's how life is. As I used to say, it is just becoming more and more <laughs> evident. No good deed goes unpunished. So we'll see. Okay, so Christine says that looking forward to the Odyssey. Correct. So at least now I'm getting a hang of how to use OBS and work with it. Switch. Uh, I still struggle a little bit to switch from one scene to another. But I think we are getting there. Now I'm going to try to adjust my streaming bit rate to the way odyssey wants and then share the odyssey link and see if we can we can huddle there <laughs> gift says bigger fish to fry get luffy after them i think so i'll have to send luffy as a guard outside hey jody how are you So Billy Blogs, we have done this discussion before. This is observed that during the COVID, in the autopsies, autopsies that people who died, the virus has been seen in many, many tissues. And I feel that a person who has become so sick that eventually they died of the cytokine storm and the shock, shock is the, the low blood pressure and the tissue damage, when the tissue damages so much that they end up dying, that means the barriers are broken down, blood vessels are breaking down, inflammation is occurring, clotting is occurring. There are lots of tissue disrupted. That is why the person dies. So uh, having virus present in so many tissues at, after the death because of COVID is probably not an indicator that in a normal healthy response, the virus wouldn't be able to go to those immune privileged sites or the barriered sites. Still, there have been studies that showed that either because of the virus disrupting the body's systems or because of the medicines used, sometimes it is possible that the sperm count is reduced or um, sperm quality may be different. But that is a transient effect. Having said that, I have not seen any um, study that says that vaccine will cause sperm count reduction or quality reduction. <laughs> Janet says, I'm so sorry. So Janet, I'm slowly becoming used to it. Um, what happened was the last September we had a complaint and audit started. That went on for a few months. Then um, we got a more serious complaint here as well that I'm still um, working with or my lawyers are. Then there is, today I got the email that is, there is a new audit started again. So we have to, we have to give access to our accounts and our uh, content and so on. So hopefully we'll be fine because at the end of the day, for 18 months, everything I've said is here on YouTube, other than the videos that YouTube took down. Um, but we have them as well on Odyssey. So everything is here. And I don't think that I have done or said anything that should generally be um, incorrect because I actually present studies. So Billy Blog says, Dr. Bean, how come androgen blockers are useful? Is this why it is generally worse in males, more ACE receptors and more androgens? Yes, so that is exactly what I discussed today, yesterday, and three days before as well. This is 
at least in theory, this is what is thought, that androgen are responsible for more TMPRSS2. And that means that the drugs that, remember we started, if you have been with me for some time, we started with Camostat Macylate from Japan. So it is used in Japan. It is approved in Japan, I think since 1950s or 60s. It is not approved in US. So Camostat Macylate was one TMPRSS2 blocker. Then we talked about bromhexin. Then we talked about another study that said bromhexin is less useful and other TMPRSS2 blockers are more useful. Um, then these two studies that we are doing, uh, which is also in similar line, the other drugs, Camostat Macylate or bromhexin, they directly inhibit TMPRSS2. They, don't, they do not work to reduce the number of TMPRSS2 or production of TMPRSS2. They just block it. And the, these drugs that we talked about, antiandrogens, they reduce the production of TMPRSS2 and hopefully production of ACE2. So during the viral disease, acute disease, these are hypothetically useful medicines. And these are this is why these studies. So Janet says, um, how do you feel about the new data about JNG? Is there new data on JNG? <laughs> My apologies. Let me quickly do a web search. So one second. If we go in here and DDS, I'm so sorry that I was scrolling fast. I was trying to quickly find out the study population and not waste your time. Uh, so if I go to JNJ vaccine efficacy. July 1, positive new data. So you got the JNJ vaccine. Let's go here. This is JNJ themselves, September 2, WHO. For this need recessive vaccine efficacy, what does WHO say? The Janssen vaccine. What do you what you need to know? This is two September twenty twenty one. Okay, so they're not really talking about the efficacy, just in general. Yale Medicine six days ago. So Pfizer BioNTech, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson. So status EUA recommended 18 and above dose single shot common side effects FDA warnings. FDA has attached two warnings to the Janssen J vaccine. In July, a rare neurological disorder, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and and out of abundance of caution, blood clotting. Uh, okay, so so Janet, I I'll have to find this uh, link where if there is some latest research. We have done the efficacy before; it has lower efficacy. Interestingly, my, my wife has JNJ and she still has side effects, very less in frequency now. They were very much in the beginning, now very less. And I think it is, um, I think we went out for vaccination in May. So May, June, July, August, September, almost five months later, she still once a week or maybe once in a 10 days time, she develops some joint pains or fatigue, and then she recovers in a in a 24 hour time period. So I wonder, is it the vaccine or the adenovirus still bothering the immune system? Or is this something else? <laughs> Billy Block says, have you had the virus yet? Apparently it is endemic now. So my scares with the virus are, uh, 
Number one, a few months ago, I was, I think I was vaccinated. We can look at those videos. I do not know if I was vaccinated at that time or it was before or after, but I was taking ivermectin. Um, I became sick. Don't know if it was uh, COVID or not. I actually thought it was COVID. I went to get my RT-PCR done. RT-PCR came back negative. I also did, uh, Rima sent me some rapid antibody tests. They were negative. But interestingly, I was taking ivermectin and I was fine. And one day I quit it and I became really sick. And maybe that was a placebo effect. Or maybe that was ivermectin and not some not COVID, but something else. Anyways, I started ivermectin again and I became okay the next day. And then I kept going till I became okay. So that was one scare I had with COVID. Then I got the Moderna vaccine. Since then I have become congested a couple of times to the point that I thought, all right, this time I caught it. And, uh, but I have not been testing myself afterwards. So don't know yet. Kira Shrem says, a study out of Monash showed ivermectin cleared all virus in 24 to 48 hours. If on ivermectin prophylactically, then used very early, why do you still think would generate antibodies? Because ivermectin does not block the virus from coming into our body, number one. Number two, even when ivermectin is present, it cannot, in the therapeutic doses, it cannot just eliminate the virus, number two. Number three, even when we say that ivermectin would interfere, I'm going to draw now, so one second. So let's say here is a cell, here is a virus, and ivermectin man is <laughs> my cute ivermectin man, uh, which I make like this. So ivermectin man is here, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry, my ivermectin man looks so funny, but hey. So this is the ivermectin man. It is present there. The possible functions that ivermectin does is number one, interfering with the cellular attachment to the um, to this uh, ACE2, correct? So that is one possibility. And I am getting, give me one second I, to understand why the screen is cut. Okay, so better now, <laughs> sorry, OBS challenges. So ACE2 is going to be, ivermectin interferes. So this is an in silico study. That means it's a computer study. It's not an in vitro or in vivo study. And they saw that ivermectin possibly disrupts or reduces the attachment of the virus to the ACE2. That doesn't mean that the virus will now never attach and any of the virus will not attach. Even if some viruses have attached to the cells, and they have gotten into the cell and they have become in, you know, replicated over there. And then they came out and they are presented on the surface. That would cause the naive T cells to come and attach and that would cause the immune system to become activated. So it is not possible that the ivermectin would just, just be sterilizing product. I don't think so. And because it is not sterilizing, that means this immune mechanism would still engage. And if this mechanism will engage, that means we will produce antibodies and we will produce cytotoxic T cells. And that means our body will learn how to work with the virus. Okay. Hope that answers that question. Um, <laughs> Truth Seeker says, low budget Batman, yes. I think I should I should get it made now that you're saying it. I'm I'm feeling a little uh, challenged, so maybe I should actually give some money to an actual artist to get it done. <laughs> DDS says that sounds funny. Okay, so 
Brandon says he's a new superhero. He is a superhero for a very long time. <laughs> Gifts. So gift you too. Ivermectin man looks like a low budget Batman. He, I have to make him better now. He doesn't look like he has his hands either. <laughs> so if I go here and here and I make his arms and his hands and I don't know why his jaw is so long <laughs> because he is a Superman. <laughs> what is wrong with his eyes? So <laughs> I am actually messing it up even more instead of making it better. So my apologies. I think we'll leave it as this low budget Batman. Maybe we'll try to give it some shade and that would help. <laughs> okay, this is it. This this is IVM man. Oh, I in the original diagram, I had this cape as well. So we should make a cape too. That would give it some further authentic <laughs> Superhero thing. Barbara says it is cute. So thank you, Barbara. And I'm sure that if you say it, then Lotus thinks the same way. So Pink says if someone uses ivermectin as a prophylaxis, can they use sanitize? So again, let me show you very quickly to all of us the disclaimer. The disclaimer is that there is no medical advice here, right? So <clears throat> We are just talking about theory. We are educating ourselves and we are sharing knowledge. That's all. No uh, advice, no medical advice. If someone uses ivermectin as a prophylaxis, can they use sanitize? So ivermectin is helping disrupt the virus. Sanitize is nitric oxide and is also helping to disrupt the virus. So I don't think that these two have any overlapping mechanisms to be contraindicated. At least I'm not aware of them. So I would not think that they have any problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Bree Nicole says, oh, yeah, for sure. He needs the eye on his chest. Yes, I remember in the original Ivermectin man, there is an eye here. Thank you for reminding me of the eye. So here is an eye. And, and just to be, now that we are doing this, if you go to Dr. Teespring, Dr. Bean store, you can actually see the actual <laughs> Ivermectin man that I made, where is that product? April accessories store, where is store? Dr. Bean Medical Lectures. So if you see here in the store here, the Ivermectin man you would see is much better drawn. <laughs> it still is, whoa, where did it go? Is the Ivermectin man hidden now? Featured products. I want to see accessories, fancy packs, apparel, let's say women's t shirts. They have removed the ivermectin man from here, or I cannot find it. Looks like, unless I am uh, mistaken, Ivermectin Man is removed, or I just cannot see it. I was trying to brag to, so if I say, I was trying to brag to say, here is how the original Ivermectin Man looked, but I can't find him. Oh well. Let me see if I can search the Ivermectin Man for everyone who's challenging me that it is not the best. So I'm going to search and show us the Ivermectin man. <laughs> so give me one quick second. Oh, 
apologies if I'm wasting your time. Can't do things on the fly. No. So one day we'll see it. Let's talk other things. Um, cool tunes made easy says, going for my first shot tomorrow. Congratulations. I'm nervous and anyone help me, please. Anything in the vaccine I should be worried about. Vaccine has been taken by millions and millions of people. So um, that doesn't mean that vaccines do not have side effects, but they have less and rare side effects compared to COVID. Vaccine can have side effects. Um, but generally, the only people they say to be more careful are those who have had uh, anaphylactic reactions in the past. Uh, and talking about the vaccine shot tomorrow, Margaret has her second Pfizer shot tomorrow as well. Mark Dilly says, why would any doctor get the experimental vaccine and be a lab rat? No, that's not the uh, correct assessment. <laughs> Janet Meslit says, Avimekin man has m uh, magical powers over us and big pharma and to eliminate. Yeah, so they, it has disappeared. So M MSNBC says severe vision loss dist disturbance from many triggers, ingredients, things eaten, drank, smelled on skin, medicine taken. Can't know them all. Scared to take messenger RNA, worry neurological side effects. So there have been, so there is a case of a young woman in my family who had Pfizer developed neurological side effects um, severe enough that she just could not help it and wanted um, attention. The eye recover protocol that I had uh, collected and put together with the help of other doctors as well, they used that twice and it she would relapse. Uh, finally, the her doctor added um, Nelexon or Naproxen actually. They added naproxen, and it is the third or fourth day, and she has become 90% happy and, and comfortable. So there are solutions to neurological outcomes, but you're correct, it is worrisome, and COVID causes that as well. Um, her doctor's uh, thinking was to her that he doesn't think it is because of the vaccine. He thinks it is just unmasking of the mast cell um, activation syndrome or other such things. So I'm just reporting what she she heard from the doctor and how they're they're managing her. Shani J says, do monoclonal antibodies interfere with the development of natural immunity? No. So the thing is this, look, when a person has so let's move the ivermectin man away from the screen so we don't see the poor ivermectin man. Okay. Uh, so let's say a person got exposed here, point A. They developed symptoms here, point B. And between A and B, there are, let's say, four, five days. Delta can actually cause symptoms faster, two, three days. During this time, there is virus. That virus has been presenting to the adaptive arm through the uh, via the innate arm. So innate arm is working during this whole time. It is presenting the virus to the adaptive arm. Adaptive arm is becoming ready. So let's say here the person develops symptoms. You, you say, hey, uh, go to the doctor. Doctor says, the person calls the doctor. Doctor says, hey, are you? you okay? Do you have a breathing problem? The person says no. And they say, okay, stay at home for some more time. So let's say they spend another couple of days. During all of this time, immune system is building a response. Now let's say 
here or here or here, the monoclonal antibodies were given because the symptoms became bad enough to alert the doctors to say we need to manage. Symptoms becoming bad enough means that there is enough quantity of the virus and there is enough response of the immune system that these symptoms are occurring. That means the immune system is working. That means our own bodies, monoclonal antibodies, not monoclonal, polyclonal antibodies will be produced. The only thing is they are not produced in sufficient numbers here and they are not able to take care of the virus. And so doctors say, you know what, let's protect the person by mopping up the virus through external help and that is monoclonal antibodies. That does not mean that this system is not working. So this system will work, will develop uh, the response. The interesting question will be, if somebody is given monoclonal antibodies as prophylaxis, so for example, let's say there is an army person who's going to go into a hot spot for let's say some uh, some civilian work some some helpful work let's say there's flooding or, or or storms or for warfare so it goes to a hot spot and now they're going to give him let's say prophylaxis beforehand to say this would help prevent development of severe disease or maybe even protection against the disease if that is the case now the question is will this person let's say they get exposed to the virus and there are already monoclonal antibodies sitting in their body. And as soon as the virus comes in, they attack it. Now, will this person develop enough viral load to develop a antibody response? I would think with the SARS-CoV-2, the way it is, it may be the case, but I'm not sure. This is one interesting situation where somebody has prophylactic antibodies and would they quickly mop up the smaller doses of the virus and not let the immune system become fully ready. Again, I do not know. I'm not saying it won't. I'm just saying I do not know. JM says, what solutions might there be to inducement of hyper hypersensitivity sensitive or fight or flight symptoms of COVID-like viral illness and AFib and tachycardia. So <clears throat> let me try to see if I can understand the... Uh, so first part of the answer for the hypersensitivity. So far we know that COVID itself does not cause allergic reaction. It can cause cytokine storm, which is a different way of triggering the immune system, but not through the allergens. So the question, I think if I go back to your question is that, how do we prevent, and this is Luffy sitting here playing with his collar. How do we prevent cytokine storm? How do we prevent uh, atrial fibrillations or tachycardias? And that is a problem we do not know. If we had figured out, how to prevent these serious disease other than from the vaccines, then we would have been doing it. Uh, we, we would have said, fine, somebody becomes sick, come to the hospital or doctor and here is a drug to give and you're fine. The, the drugs that were used and that showed promise were ivermectin, hydroxy, zinc, and you saw what we did to them. Uh, hydroxy, as soon as Trump talked about it, it became a target. Then um, more recently now, ivermectin was intentionally, I think, um, bad-mouthed to the point that uh, folks started calling it horse paste or horse dewormer or, or dog dewormer and so on. So they, I saw a video which was very interesting for me to saw, see. I'll try to find it for tomorrow's chit chat. There was an MSNBC host. He was talking about ivermectin to a doctor. And he was saying that, hey, there are ivermectin is a drug that is a horse dewormer. And then he he kind of brought his eyes down. He he broke the eye contact and he said, although provided we know that it is also used for humans too. So I could see the 
him being disingenuous right there. And he knew that this is not just for horse, but he knew that I'm causing this verbiage to be created. So it's just, what's going on with Luffy? So ideally there are medicines and there will be more medicines as well that can be helpful. If we say all of those medicines don't count, then we don't have a solution. CJ says, is elevated ferritin level a marker for inflammation or a cause of inflammation negative for hemochromatosis? So uh, normally, elevated ferritin levels normally are a result of inflammation. But an elevated ferritin levels can be because of other diseases too. But usually in healthy people, ferritin levels, when they increase, they're usually because of inflammation. Billy Block says, have you any information on the use of quercetin zinc as possible therapeutics? I have had that discussion. My very first video, after talking about that Stanford fake letter, I talked about hydroxy. It is so funny that this has been happening to me for 18 months now. The very first video when I put it up about hydroxy, somebody sent me a message saying, do you not know that this is uh, a drug that kills people and when somebody would die, it would be your responsibility and so on. So I took the video down. Then I put disclaimers up and then I put it up again. Again, these are educational discussions, but even then I get all of these pushbacks and feedbacks from ever. So I put the hydroxy up. Then I talked about quercetin and zinc as well. So um, Billy, if you go to the early part of my videos, if they have not been taken down by YouTube yet, um, there are these discussions. Not that I'm aware of, uh, Agi. And I think I should ask him actually. Yeah, so Kay Molier, I actually reached out to Juan. We, I was seeing some of the cool beans talking about Juan being, um, his account being disabled on Twitter. I reached out to Juan today because I wanted to, he keeps a very good eye on when a drug was started and what was happening. So I asked him that, hey, can you walk me through these uh, charts? So hopefully in another day or so. I don't want to just put the chart up and spitball about it and not have a better, a uh, more precise and correct answer. So I would learn or maybe have one with us in the discussion and we'll discuss it. Truth Seeker says, I feel so bad Dr. Bean is so honest and true to be harassed in this way. So I think this is part of life, right? There are people who are at this time losing their life because of COVID. And so, I, I just think that harassments and these audits and these complaints and these are still compared to what is happening to people. So okay to let go says Dr. Marek wants hypothyroid managed with synthyroid in women, me should shun the quercetin. So quercetin, will, I'll have to look at the mechanism. I think it does uh, cause more hypothyroid. It, it reduces the thyroid hormone release. I did remember I discussed this mechanism once. I can look into it once more. Can you please tweet that to me so I can remember to work on it? Robin has a very specific question. Robin, I actually don't have an answer for this one. Have you heard if any vaccines have caused any clotting issues in people with venous insufficiency and lymphedema in their lower legs? 
I have not. I have not seen study data. My thinking is that the venous insufficiency or lymphedema eventually causes the fluids to be stagnant. And that stagnant fluids are, so let's say this is the lower limb and there are, there is edema in here. And we know that that edema predisposes and especially the blood stagnation in the veins predisposes to uh, clot formation because veins have valves in them and if there is stagnation of the blood flow then the blood collects under these valves here so blood is supposed to go this way and actually i made the valves wrong uh, valves should be made this way so the, these valves act like steps and as the blood a piece of blood moves up the valve, when it pushes back to fall back the valve kind of closes and the blood gets trapped here then with the next heartbeat for example it moves up again and then this valve closes and the blood gets trapped here and so on and when that blood is trapped here and it is slow in these angles there is propensity to start forming clots because the blood moves the least in the ang those angles and if somebody already has um, stagnation and then there is a creation of further vascular inflammation then it is possible for the clotting to increase so um, the platelet factor for antibodies causing clotting could then be superimposed here and maybe accelerate the clotting but having said that i'm only thinking about the mechanism allowed i have not heard of these uh, data points because it's a very specific condition Okay, okay to let go says I'll tweet to you, Dr. Marek test. Thank you very much. Robin, you're wel welcome. S. Shetri says, are the wild S proteins similar to S proteins from messenger RNA? In theory, yes. So think about it. If the if the viral S protein and the vaccine S protein are very different, then how will vaccine produce immunity for the virus? So they have to be actually similar. And there is a very tiny difference between the S proteins. On the, so for example, the messenger RNA in the vaccine, in some vaccines, and I give credit to Doug, I always remember it, um, <clears throat> In some vaccines, the S protein is locked. So locked mean that when the S protein is formed, they have a locking mechanism or some additional amino acids that kind of create a lock for the S protein and it cannot open up. Some vaccines do not have that. But this is the kind of change. Remaining S protein is similar. And if it is not, if it was not similar, then the vaccine will not be effective because it will not make the antibodies that are trained against the virus. And this is why they're saying that as the virus is changing its spike protein, so let's say this is the virus and it is changing its spike protein. As the virus changes its spike protein, the antibodies produced here in theory will lose their capability to bind with it and that is the escape. Although that has not happened, but this proves that the, the vaccine induced or produced spike and the virus spike should be similar. Anthony Stefano says, in a past video, you showed how they locked the spike protein by adding more hats, stacking S12. Yes. Can this cause more S1 release? So ideally, they locked them down. When they lock them down, the point of locking down was that they cannot be open and they cannot be cleaved. 
So in this locked state, in theory, the cleavage of S1 from S2 is less possible. That was the intent that they should not become cleaved. S1 should not become separated and attached to S2 and uh, sorry, to AS and now the S2 is showing and S2 is not the normal structure of the virus spike protein. So making antibodies against S2 is useless because when the virus enters the body, its spike protein is not in S2 configuration, it is S1 and S2 configuration. So because of that, they locked it. So ideally, this should be less, but we are seeing that Dr. Patterson's um, study shows that there are people who are getting S2. Kira Shram says, do you think furine inhibitors like folic acid, andrographes, and antipastic diaminase show, show diaminazine, diaminazine show prophylactic promise? So we know that there has been studies about furine inhibitors, that they have a potential benefit. I have not seen any study that actually showed the benefit. <laughs> Gazer, long time no see. There's no vaccine for what's coming. Example, global heating, global warming. Hmm. Zaid says, thank you, Dr. Me, for all you teach. You're very welcome. Leon Rose says, Dr. Me, do you know about all day chemists out of India? Have been ordering from them for years. Checked yesterday and med was still available. I have no idea. So, <laughs> don't know. Catherine, thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Bean, that spike protein looks like the Michelin tire man. Yes. <laughs> I like to make cute cartoons. Roman is here. Somebody said, thanks, Roman. I haven't seen Roman. Roman, are you here? Gold country is here. Are the other prostate drugs like doxazosine and finasteride useful for C19? So I believe that finasteride too, I'm sure that all antiandrogens can be useful. They are looking at, the proxalutamide was looked at because it has dual action. The finasteride or dutasteride would gen generally be because they are blocking the production of dihydrotestosterone. So anything that would reduce it will be useful. I think the doctors just have to figure out what would have the least side effects and still be useful. So Cool Tune says, will our bodies completely rid of the vaccine at some point? So let me give you the answer with a caveat. Caveat is that for the adenovirus-based vaccine, I'm still not clear because I heard my, my wife had Johnson & Johnson and she said to me that, hey, I heard that Johnson & Johnson said that it, it is possible that their adenovirus-based vaccine can continue to build immunity for months and months. So why? Um, is it the adenovirus sticking out there and the DNA pieces sticking in the nucleus for a longer period of time? Ideally, that should not happen. If we now look at the Pfizer study for Moderna or Pfizer or messenger RNA, that study showed how long the lipid nanoparticle stays, so nine to 12 days. Majority is cleared out within two to three days. Now, how long the messenger RNA itself stays, and I had done a discussion about that, that usually messenger RNAs clear out in three to four days after doing their function inside the cells. So I would suspect that normally clearing out the, of the vaccine and the components of the vaccine should be within nine to 12 days, at least for the messenger RNA-based vaccines. Now for the vaccines that are adenovirus-based, I am still not very much clear. I thought this is what would happen with them as well. I need to do more study on that.
<laughs> Sebastian says, yes, nice Michelin spike. Roman is here. Roman, how are you? Hope all is well. Uh, yes, just other than the complaints and audits and videos being taken down. And it is so funny that um, YouTube gave me a strike. And then they said, if you had more strikes in two in 90 days, then your channel will be permanently blocked. And they gave me a strike on a video that was uploaded in Feb. So I thought, OK, um, I'm going to remove those uh, videos and just leave them on Odyssey. So of course, that means there are lesser videos. And now YouTube sent me this message saying, or well, they put that on, publishing fewer video is causing your channel views, <laughs> views to be lower. So the channel went down from 400,000 views in 48 hours to 100,000 views in 48 hours. So these are the general things that are happening, Roman. How about you? So can we please ask Dr. Sabine Hazan to come talk about microbiome, gut health, and COVID? Absolutely. Let me take a note. Did we reach out to her before? So Dr. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, you know what? I'll forget. So I'm going to ask my assistant right now. Right. So, Roman, how is your new assignment going? So JM says, any ideas on treatment for COVID-induced excessive fight or flight for no reason? Ex exercise intolerance, tachycardia, and AFib. So that is a COVID long haul. COVID long haul, cardiovascular or sympathetic issues, cardiovascular issues, neurological issues. Tachycardia can occur because of many things. Um, the eye recover pro protocol has helped a lot of people. In addition to that, there are doctors who are adding, for example, Bruce Patterson's group uses Moraviroc and they, they swear by it that it really helps. Uh, statins, uh, they're saying that, that really, they really help as well. So these are the drugs that you have to talk with your doctor. They, are, they should be taken over the counter. Uh, Moraviroc has severe side effects and the statins can also cause side effects. So should be with your doctor's consultation, but there is help out there. Catherine says, I can't imagine that the last 18 months would, would have been like without the education I received from you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, we were talking Texas, Meg. And Texas, I hope you're doing OK. Uh, uh, we, we wish you well and praying for you. Texas has been really, really helpful. Uh, Texas and others on Discord were talking about um, the discussion. So who left this message that it was great to be uh, with me during this time. And I want to say that it was great to be with you during this time as well. When I started, uh, this was Cheese Head Bean and uh, Jean Bean that they were talking about it with Texas, with fi Finn Bean and Rye and some more folks. So anyways, the discussion was about the journey together. And believe me, when I started it, I did not set out to say, I'm going to go do something amazing and, and have um, people listen to me and discuss things with me. That was never the plan. I just became so irritated at that um, note from that was on the WhatsApp and somebody sent it to me and that note had said it is by some Stanford scientist and this is how to uh, help against the COVID and the whole thing was a bunch of BS and I thought it would kill people if they followed it and I talked about it. Interestingly, Facebook banned me right away. YouTube removed it as well. I cannot actually find that. Then I appealed to Facebook. They put it back up uh, and tragically, this thing which, which I took 
and said, I need to talk with people to say, don't do it. My own friend's brother died of COVID by following this. So that's very unfortunate that it actually, what I was trying to protect others with, it actually came very close to my own uh, situation. So since then, having us all together has been a big therapy for me as well. I can't imagine having 18 months at home, locked down, and uh, be staying sane. So my sanity was to daily produce something and read and read and draw and draw. And I forgot that we are in a pandemic. So I'm, I'm grateful and thankful to all the cool beans who've been here. Uh, Roman says, thank you. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Keeping busy with the new job and learning a lot. Dr. Hazan has great and informative posts. I will reach out. Thank you very much. Good to know that you're doing well. So Texas says, and Texas, thank you very much. And all YouTube admins, thank you very much. All admins on Discord, thank you very much. Uh, I can only imagine that if I am getting so much attacked by cool, not so cool beans, <laughs> I don't know how you are uh, faring during all of this. Uh, so thank you to everyone. And my request to the YouTube moderators, please on Discord, especially Hollett Rose, if you could join the YouTube moderator channel on Discord and have a discussion with the team. So CJ, with JNJ continue to create antibodies, does this indicate that the wax is still present and active in the system? So this is this is a third hand concept. My wife said to me that JNJ said it continues. I haven't gotten that data yet. So without looking at it, I cannot say, and this is my curiosity as well, to think, to understand, is it the adenovirus that has triggered the immune system, which is causing the side effects? Is it the DNA piece? that is inside the adenovirus that has a spike protein DNA and that is sitting in the nucleus for a longer period of time. I have to do that research. Ellen Coolbean says this is so infuriating, infuriating Dr. Bean, you're so important. Thank you very much. Uh, just like there is, so 99.9% .9 of the Cool beans are cool beans, and they have been supportive, they've been loving, caring, and we've become a tribe, we've become a caravan who has helped ourselves during this time. But there is, there are some who are very upset, and there are both, <laughs> there are folks who are very upset from uh, anti-vaccine groups who says, why do you talk about vaccines? And they call me vaccine pusher. And I have never hidden that I have taken my vaccines. I would like people to take their vaccines. My family has taken their vaccines. So because of that, I am in the bad books for those who do not want vaccines. Although I thought I have done a lot of service for those who also didn't like vaccine by presenting so many alternative, um, not alternatives to vaccines, but so many possibilities to keep ourselves safe. And we all did those kind of things uh, in one way or the other when the vaccines were not there. So I get hammered by them. And then on the pro-vaccine side, when I talk about ivermectin or hydroxy or zinc or others, they become upset and they blame me that somehow my talks are stopping people from taking vaccine. And I have always said that it is really a person's own uh, decision. Who am I to make a decision? I can't make that decision or I shouldn't make that decision for my wife and my kids. Why would I go out and preach to someone else to say, you must take the vaccine or you must not take the vaccine? But pro-vaccine folks become very upset. The, the, me the method to attacks are different. And <laughs> this is what has happened. But 
I think we have done very well. We have learned together. We have stuck together. We have um, understood many mechanisms together, which are not only useful for pandemic. They would be those educational pieces are our assets even for future. Grace says, Dr. Mean, you're the person who helped me have the understanding to feel comfortable to take the messenger RNA vaccine. Thank you very much. I am very, very happy with that. Thank you very much and congratulations. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> So this is a good question. K. Molya says, any update from Dr. Shankara Shetty? I have not reached out to him recently. I think I should reach out to him again just to see how is he doing nowadays. OK, I'll ask him. Simple Tycoon says, can contact with COVID-19 particles in amounts too low for infection eventually lead to antibody production over time? Can antibodies develop with a viral load undetectable by PCR? So the second part of the question, yes. First part of the question, no. If the viral load is small enough that infection does not occur. Infection, so let me give two uh, definitions of infection. The medical technical definition of infection means the arrival of the pathogen in us, just the presence in us is infection. So that means even if it is 10 particles that arrived in our mouth or nose or eyes, we are infected. When the pathogen starts doing the damage, and we develop enough damage accumulates that we develop symptoms, then that is called disease. Although many times these are used interchangeably. Now, if I look at the word infection that you use over here, and if I say amounts too low for infection, so even if it is one virus and it is <clears throat> in our mouth, by definition it is infection. But if I take infection as a more commonly understood word where infection means entering the cells, dividing, coming out of them, and possibly causing enough damage to cause symptoms. And then your question leads into two directions. Yes, symptoms and no symptoms. So if the viral load is enough to cause symptoms, then we will have the um, antibodies produced. If the viral load is enough to cause the disease, but there are no symptoms. So that means technically by definition, there is no disease, but we still have virus in the cells and it is breaking the cells and it is being presented on the cell surfaces and the adaptive arm is responding. And probably it is the beautiful innate arm and the cytotoxic part of the adaptive arm that took care of it. And we didn't even know that this happened then antibodies could still be there, but they are not necessary because the other wings of the immune system has taken care of it. Now, if we said that the load is small enough, that enough damage has not occurred, enough cell entrance has not occurred, enough um, symptoms did not occur, that means we did not really trigger the immune system. If that is the case, then there are going to be no antibodies. So if I summarize my answer, there are people who take care of the virus without producing a lot of antibodies because their innate arm and their cytotoxic arm works very well. And then there are people who work with the antibodies and respond. And it's not necessary that they have symptoms and they can still produce antibodies. Skyfrog is leaving us. <laughs> Skyfrog, good night. So LL Cool Bean says, Pfizer-induced headaches have subsided, but tinnitus is still annoying as hell. Fluvoxamine doesn't help. Have, the, have thrown the kitchen sink at this. Have you tried? So if you talk with your doctor, uh, this um, family member of mine after Pfizer developed tinnitus, and uh, she has really responded well to the eye recover protocol plus, um, what was that? 
naloxon naproxen so maybe talk with your doctor about that and again please this is not an advice it's just educational sharing from what they did to you they were doctors who did it and you would need to talk with your doctor as well uh, reema says wouldn't someone taking statins spironolactone have protection in any case less likely to get severe ideally yes ideally yes and if it is a woman and vaccinated yes uh, so ideally statins if they have protective effect then they should have an effect when they're used and spironolactone is useful as well in a similar way because it is anti androgenic in women uh, it has less function spironolactone compared to statin polyatros polyat are you on discord um, if you are can you join the youtube admins channel there dr mubin do you know if there have been any studies on the effects of arbs on covid very very good question and this question has been circulating in the, in the on the internet for a long time so american um heart association and i believe in combination i discussed that about a year ago i think in association with the hypertension some association with hypertension uh they had come out and they said none of the studies have proven that angiotensin receptor blockers are helpful or harmful so their statement was if you are using arbs then don't stop them thinking of covid and if you are not using arbs don't start using them for covid so they said status quo so that is the data at least for a year ago dave says thank you that was my question also when you do the titer test for antibodies my friend has 10.02 is that a good protection level or should it be higher so i have uh, talked about this many times before as well i'll explain it but first so it is frustrating for me as well to continue to give the disclaimers so my apologies but i'll say not an advice not a specific answer for a specific person that is between them and their doctor from a mechanism point of view i can talk about it and the mechanism is actually very very simple so if we talk about the titers every test for these antibodies the test kit itself has some sort of uh, number on it and it says that hey our threshold usually is about 6 or so our threshold is let's say 6 above that is positive below that is negative positive or reactive reactive mean that hey we put these antibodies from this person or their blood with the antigen from the sars cov 2 and they coagulated they clotted they reacted now the question is it protective or not that is a question that cannot be easily answered here is why if a person is in an active antibody forming state that means let's say i got infected now and a month later my antibodies are done and they come back to be 10 11 something a low number still higher than the the threshold but still a low number does this mean that i am not protected so the first question did i not have the infection and recover so that means i was protected if it is a vaccine then i don't know if i will be this will be sufficient or not and the question now is when is this number generated is it when the vaccine just did its function that is after the two weeks after the or 14 days after the second dose if it is still a lower number then maybe vaccine did not do enough of antibody production or enough triggering of the immune system maybe a booster is needed or maybe the person needs to figure out if their immune system is responding correctly or not and then 
it is also possible that the person actually is going to respond primarily through the cytotoxic route, which is a robust route, which is T helper one pathway, compared to T helper two uh, antibody pa pathway or humoral pathway. So some people respond on this side with less strength and they respond more here. Now the antibodies may be low, but they still may be able to handle the infection very well. So that means because we don't really know what is happening inside, the titer level itself cannot really give, just alone the titer level cannot tell us what would happen. Greetings from Norway. Ashley Stein says, greetings back to you from US. <clears throat> so Sasha says, I started Spirone Electron since I read it can help with the EBV and my post-vaccine issues included EBV reactivation. Did you say, say, just say it had another action that can help with tinnitus? No, um, these were two separate things. I was talking about spironolactone being an anti-androgen and potentially helping to reduce the severity of COVID. And everyone who has... Uh, uh, any neurological symptoms, tinnitus, uh, pressure in the head, headaches, please talk with your doctors. Look at eye recover protocol. Plus, more importantly, look at naproxen or those drugs and talk with them to see if this is something that may be uh, suitable for you. Again, not an advice. A an advice to talk with your doctor, but not a medical advice. So Cool Tunes Made Easy says, is the tinnitus an effect with all vaccines or Pfizer? I think it is all, but Pfizer has a, at least I hear more about Pfizer, so it's not a scientific conclusion. Robin says, I've learned so much from you, Dr. Bean. Thank you for your honesty, impartiality, and always using data to back up your educational points. Wish I could do the same thing more. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ashley says, Lal, thank you for the laugh. You're very welcome. Thank you for the hello from there, far off. Gazer says, night, night back to you as well. We are almost done here as well. So, <laughs> Logic says, Vikings are underrated and found America, not Columbus or Vespucci. So the only introduction of mine to Vikings is the, the TV series Vikings. So Yashpal has a very good question. What um, determines that some respond to cytotoxic through cytotoxic or humor alarm. Is it genetic? This is a million dollar question. If we knew this, in, in case of COVID, why does in some people it becomes predominantly cytotoxic and in some it becomes predominantly humoral? If we knew this, we would just move it to cytotoxic and be much better off. We don't know. So maybe it is genetic genetic. Maybe it is environmental. Maybe it is um, the comorbidities. Don't know. But that's, that's the main question. 
So you are on the question. So uh, GIF24 says low dose naltrexone and modulating inflammation. I think that is what it is doing. But it, interestingly, it is helping. Rima says, I've been keeping an informal track of breakthroughs and all are Pfizer. One may be J&J. Do we know where to get this data? So at least if we can get data which is properly put together, uh, that will be UK. If just Pfizer data, then that will be Israel. I am just not very much clear on the data for the US. US is collecting data as well. And I think there is every once in a while that debrief that happens on CDC and they have a PowerPoint presentation. But I think UK and Israel have done a better job. Dr. Amar says, Dr. Bing, can we give flu vaccine to someone who just received monoclonal antibodies or wait 90 days? I don't think that there is a need to wait 90 days. Again, not a specific answer for a specific person, just in general, thinking a lot from mechanism. Um, still, if the therapies can be separated, it is useful so that the side effects of one can be separated from the side effects of the other. Marina Rose, so let's make this our last question for today. Marina Rose says, what in O type blood could make people not get severe COVID? So number one, it is actually not true that they don't get severe COVID. So please, people with the type O blood, be careful. Secondly, um, we have done, the <laughs> I just I just looked at this, M. Gregory says, Pakistani Viking. Okay, so... Uh, secondly, there was a Chinese study, I discussed it about one and a half year ago. In that study, what they said was, they said that because blood group O have bleeding tendency, and the reason for that is, and there are many mechanisms, but reason for that is that their factor 8 is not as... Um, it is slightly different. And because of that, they have less factor A or less functional factor A. That means their bleeding tendency compared to a healthy person is not the same. Or I shouldn't say bleeding. Their clotting uh, phenomena doesn't work as uh, correctly as other blood groups clotting. Because of this, clotting is slightly difficult in them. So when SARS-CoV-2 come into our body and causes a severe disease and causes inflammation, and part of that inflammation, vascular inflammation, is the clot formation. Blood group O have an advantage that they will not clot as rapidly and as often as other blood groups. But this effect is still not as profound to say if somebody is blood group O, they would not have a severe disease. They would have a little more resistance to severe compared, or not even severe, more resistance to developing clots compared to others. And that is because they have a bleeding tendency. So T100 Wizard says, why would I take an experimental injection for a disease I have already overcome? That makes no sense. Also, the injections do not prevent infection or transmission. What's the point? So I actually have been having the same discussion. If somebody has 
successfully managed their COVID in a, I use the term healthy way, meaning without getting severe, without going near death, without got, getting too much organ damage, in a normal, healthy fashion, they got COVID, they, they took care of it, then really what would vaccine add to them? So this statement is now going to cause some people to go and complain further. <laughs> Um, Sean says that CDC stopped recording breakthrough cases in May. No, that is not the case. They said there are two types of breakthrough cases. Those that are just generally breakthrough cases. So I was vaccinated and I got, let's say, cold-like symptoms and I'm still at home. I'm doing okay, but it, it may be uh, uh, COVID. I went for a PCR. PCR is positive. That is a breakthrough case. They said we will not measure and follow up. I, and again, this doesn't mean I agree with them. I'm just explaining what did they do. They said such cases, we will not follow them. We will not count them because it takes too much of an effort to follow up and figure out and there are going to be too many of these cases. Instead, they said for us now in the breakthrough cases, we would only measure those who are in the hospitals and follow them up and analyze them. And if they die, we'll figure out what happened, what were their comorbidities, how were they managed, and so on. What was the virus that was infecting them? So that means they're still working on the breakthrough cases, but only those that are hospitalized or become severe. Again, that I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong. See, Luffy agrees with me. I'm not saying it, I'm right, they're right or wrong. I'm just saying this is the clarification of this. Luffy, what happened? Time to stop. <laughs> okay. So, Doug Johnson says, Dr. Bean, is monoclonal antibody mechanism of action similar to ivermectin? No, no. So monoclonal antibody, or in case of Regeneron, it is actually two monoclonal antibodies. And I love it if they were just giving Regeneron to people right from the beginning, even now. Um, as much as I do not agree with the mask anti-mask mandate by Florida's governor, I do agree with Regeneron and his push for the Regeneron and with his... Uh, continuously voicing about it, people becoming aware of it. Remember, I had been saying it is available, but one has to ask for it. And so he is making that, that uh, message mainstream, which is excellent. So if I answer the question here, monoclonal ant antibody. So let's say here is a uh, <laughs> Michelin tire, which is the the so let's make him a li real little tire so let's say here is a SARS-CoV-2 with these Michelin tire spikes um, the monoclonal antibody's job is to bind with the spike proteins right this is their job this is it to bind with the spike protein then they do biological functions what are the functions? I, I sometimes feel that we should talk about exactly what does an antibody do when it is present. So the biological functions are, for example, number one, when the antibodies are connected here, when these are connected to the virus, they're coating the virus, virus will find it difficult to settle somewhere, attach to a cell and enter the cell and do stuff. So that is one way of protection by providing mechanical obstruction to the virus's activities. This is like a car wants to move about, but there is a boot on the car's tire and they have to move with the boot on and it's difficult. The second part of what antibodies do is that when they get attached to an antigen, so let's say this is the antibody, if I make it here, when an antibody becomes bound to an antigen, 
then there is a tiny window opens on the stem of the antibody on the fc part of the antibody the fraction constant of the antibody this tiny window that opens up allows the complement to become attached here and the complement attachment then causes complement activation complement activation causes opsonization that is the word i had to remember again and again opsonization means easy to digest so if the virus is attached here and it is sad now because it is bound and then the complement is activated this activated complement is going to try to destroy the virus plus activated complement is going to try to attract the phagocytes to say please come in and eat us and the phagocytes would eat this so that is opsonization in addition to this antibodies can also bind to fc gamma receptors on many cells dendritic cells macrophages natural killer cells mast cells there are many cells that can have antibodies bind to them now when the antibodies are bound to them more important are dendritic macrophages they would then cause phagocytosis of this complex or they would cause other biological reactions as well so this is the function of monoclonal antibodies and good function uh, I wish Regeneron was stacked up everywhere and used as soon as somebody develops symptoms. I believe with Regeneron as well, just like we talk about Ivermectin, with Regeneron as well, if it was given a lot, it would have been very, very helpful in reducing death and misery. Now, Ivermectin's functions so let's say this is the virus. One theoretical function in silico study showed that the ivermectin actually binds between the ACE2, ACE2 and the spike protein and kind of stalls the, this uh, binding and entry of the virus to the cell. So that is very different mechanism compared to an antibody. Although you could say antibody binds here as well and stalls this, this as well. So here this, these mechanisms could be similar. Then when the virus is inside the cell, then we have done this discussion that it, ivermectin disrupts RDRP of the virus, three chymotrypsin-like protease of the virus, and important alpha and beta of the virus. And in my previous discussions about ivermectin that are now down on YouTube and are on Odyssey, I have the links to the studies as well that can be seen. And then we also know that ivermectin modulates the nuclear factor kappa B pathway to these are not the functions of a monoclonal antibody so <clears throat> different functions so with this how about if we stop for today and we will continue tomorrow So please do me a favor, um, please like, subscribe and share. And if you would like to uh, support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can be a patron or you can support this via PayPal. And another news about Margaret, not only she's gonna get her second dose tomorrow, Margaret has ordered her phone Friday, she will receive her phone, then she would set it up, and hopefully from next week, we will have Margaret back with us. So with this, thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow.